you have your Bibles, I'd like you to uh, turn to Psalm 18 and to Hebrews chapter 11. So Psalm 18 and Hebrews chapter 11 tonight. We will begin in Hebrews chapter 11, then we'll turn back to Psalm chapter 18. As we look at this portion of Scripture, this particular psalm is a power-packed psalm. Some of the psalms I will read from verse 1 to the end. I will not Psalm 18. There's 50 verses in Psalm 18. And you ought to later on go back, if you've not recently read Psalm 18, you ought to read Psalm 18. It is a power packed, filled with just majesty and glory and strength. We're going to look at some parts of it tonight. But in Hebrews chapter 11, I want to point us to one verse to kind of provide the framework for Psalm chapter 18. You know, the Bible is, is not isolated. The Bible works together like this. The scripture verse for that is there's no, uh, there's no private interpretation of scripture. It doesn't just mean that I privately can interpret scripture, though some people, some people try to do that. Well, this verse means to me. Well, it doesn't really matter what it means to you. It matters what God meant when he said it. But that verse specifically means that the Bible is intertwined with itself, that the Bible defines Bible. And that a portion of scripture it typically has another one that parallel with it or will help bring light to this. And in Hebrews chapter 11, there is a part of the Christian life that we need to be regularly reminded of. There's a part of the Christian life that we will, when we're not on guard for it, will fail. We will stumble. We will trip. And it's the portion of the Christian life that we refer to as faith. We're saved by faith, and we're supposed to walk by faith. And what happens in the life of a Christian, the life of most people, is that when they come to the point of salvation, whether they're real young or whether they're further along in life, they see their need for salvation. And by faith, they release control of their destiny, release control of their sin, and say, God, I trust in Jesus. And by faith, believe in Jesus Christ. And then we begin this journey called the Christian life. We walk by faith, not by sight, except in the Christian life we often walk by sight and add in and sprinkle in some faith. We see the situation and we logically prepare through it and, and then sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on top like he's a salt shaker. Jesus blessed my decisions and, oh, thanks for helping me. It worked out just fine. Jesus was involved in it. Jesus was, was top of it. Rather than truly living a life of faith, where if I can, we let go and let God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. Not an unfamiliar verse to those who have been around the word of God. To those who have been to church. But to new Christians may be unfamiliar, one or less familiar. Where the Bible says this, but without faith. If there is not faith, if there is a lack of faith. If there is the wrong faith, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Not that it is hard to please him. Not that you'll have to do extra to please him. Not that you'll have to figure out another way. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. My friends, God is. I am that I am. God is. What is he? Everything I need, whether I realize it or not, everything I need is found in God. Every problem that I face can be found, the solution can be found in the Almighty. For I must believe that he is and, the verse doesn't stop there, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Not them that sprinkle this little religion on top, not them that provide lip service to God, but them, to those, to the man, to the woman, to the teenager, to the one in, four, in fourth grade or to the toddler, to anyone that diligently seeks God, he will reward that seeking. See, tonight I want to challenge us in our faith again. 
If you would turn back, please, to Psalm chapter number 18. The Psalm of David. The Bible tells us that this psalm was written and proclaimed and sung after he found some great victory from enemies and from salvation from the hand of Saul. This past week in my Bible reading, I came again across the story and the account of when Saul turned on David. We read and listened to that portion of Scripture where the first time Saul becomes to become really upset. It began with some girls singing. And you remember that they were singing about Saul and Saul has slain his thousands and I imagine Saul was just like, oh, that's so nice. Look at me. I'm a warrior. I'm a winner. This is great. And, and then he hears the rest of the song. David, his ten thousands. David, what has David done? Killed a little Goliath. At that point, Saul had a new enemy. His name was David. Saul at that point said, David, I want to kill you. We talk about this in our family devotions. David, I want you to marry my daughter so you'll die. That's what he says. David, I, I think so much of you, I really want you to be part of my family so you'll die. When that didn't work, he found that David liked his other daughter. And he thinks, aha, this is perfect. Now David will die. When that didn't work, and his plan didn't work out, then did, uh, Saul says, you know what? I'll kill him myself with a javelin. And he throws a javelin multiple times at David. When that didn't work and he didn't show up, Jonathan protects him, his own son. He says, Jonathan, not only will David die, but you're going to die. He throws a javelin at Jonathan. And Jonathan fled. At that point, Saul just begins to hunt him down. And now David is on a path of death. From this path, God brought some victories. After this victory, he is king for a while that we believe this psalm was penned. The challenge tonight is this. We already have faith. You and I exercise faith every single day. But it's high time that we exercise our faith in the Lord. You see, sometimes people say, well, I wish I could have your faith. I wish I could have that kind of faith. I wish I could have mountain-moving faith. The fact is, every day, everybody lives by faith. You trust one another. You drive down the road, and you trust the guy in the other, in the other lane not to hit you. You may drive guarded, but you're driving by faith. You go to a restaurant, you order something, and by faith, you think you're going to get it. Do you not? You call the doctor and he gives you information and you follow it by faith. We can trust men, so why not trust God? Why not exercise that faith in God, in Jehovah? We have faith in what we see. Well, I saw it with my own eyes, so it must be true. But have you ever seen optical illusions? Have you ever seen a magic trick? They can be pretty convincing, can they not? I tend to enjoy sleight of hand. And someone who is very accomplished can do things that are just so incredibly smooth. There are times that I even will know how they have done this particular trick and their speed of execution is just masterful. But it's not magic, it's still a trick. And our eyes can deceive us. You ever thought you saw something but it's not what you saw? There's water up there. Nope, it's a mirage. I thought for sure I saw that. Nope. You see, we have faith in what we see, but our eyes can be deceived. We have faith in what we hear. Well, so-and-so told me, and you know they'd never lie to me. Well, probably not. But they may have gotten it wrong. Well, you know, I read it on the Internet. Now, we laugh about that, but how often do you, take, do you take for granted what you read on the Internet? Well, I'm just going to Google it. I thought at one time it would be hilarious to, like, plant false information about, like, normal things. Right? But it's already been done. <laughs> the Earth's not round. It's flat. The moon's not real. It's cheese. 
We have faith in what we hear. We have faith in what we experience. But here the psalm is going to turn our attention to have faith in God. In this psalm, we're going to see some powerful words. I want us to look tonight, before we pray, at these first two verses. As we find some words of trust and words of faith that build the foundation for this psalm. Look, please, in Psalm 18, verses 1 and 2. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Now watch these descriptive words in verse number 2. The Lord is my, what's the next word? The Lord is my rock and my, and my, my, and my, and whom I will, my, and the, and my high, high tower. Look at that in verse number two. Do you see those words? Do you see the faith that David is exercising inside of the psalm? Do you, see, do you see how he's saying, listen, there is a place that I run to. There is a place that I lean on. There is a place that I draw from, and his name is Jehovah. Amen. Over the next 48 verses, over the next 48 verses, he just reiterates verses 1 and 2. Next 48 verses, he's going to describe what he has previously told us in verse 1 and 2. In the next 48 verses, he is going to demonstrate, he is going to reveal, and he's going to explain exactly why God is his high tower, why God is his strength, why God is his horn of salvation, why God is his God, and why God is a place that he decided to place his trust. So the challenge tonight is that you and I, would take the faith that we already exercise. We exercise it all day, every day. And place it not in what we see. Not in what we hear. But in God. Lord, as we look at your word tonight, I'd ask that you would help us. Lord, there are many things that pull and seek to undermine our faith in you or none less powerful than the devil, who with his fiery darts wants to cause us to doubt the veracity of your word, the goodness of your work, the perfection of your plan. Lord, I pray that tonight our hearts would be stirred, our minds would be prodded, and the Lord, tonight, we would again come back to you by faith, Lord, perhaps we've grabbed the wheel and the control. Lord, tonight we put it back in your hands and lean and rest fully in you. In Jesus' name I ask and pray. Amen. I want to direct our attention tonight in Psalm 18 just to one verse. And look at just one verse. It's probably my favorite verse in Psalm chapter 18. It's one that I've memorized, one that I've meditated on, one that I've clung to. And for some people, it may even be a life verse. It could be. I'd like you to look down in Psalm chapter 18. You can read in Psalm 18 about the words of trust in verses 1 and 2, words of design and strength, verses 6 through about 17 and 18, and words of safety beginning about in verse number 29 or so to the end of the chapter. But I'd like you to look in verse number 30. We find three aspects of Faith that is a real faith. Faith that is a relying faith. And tonight, just direct our attention to Psalm 18, verse 30, where the Bible says this, As for God, as for the strong one, as for the one that I've been describing and talking about and showing his designs, as for God, his way is perfect. As for God, the word of the Lord is tried as for God, he is a buckler to all those that trust in him. I want to point out three aspects from this verse just very quickly tonight. These are not going to be brand new thoughts for you tonight. But like I've told you many times, often in my life and often in your life, the problem is not a knowing problem. The problem is a doing problem. Tonight I want to encourage your hearts. I want to remind, I want to remind your spirit about who God is and how he works 
from Psalm chapter 18. And three aspects in this verse. Number one in Psalm chapter 18, we see that little phrase, as for God. Speaking of God, I see, first of all, the perfection of his way. As for God, his way is perfect. When our faith becomes undermined, one of the first things that happens is that we begin to question God's way. It seems that that is one of the initial attacks from the wicked one. The fiery darts that he may fire or throw at us in our minds and our hearts that begins to, to have us question. He wants us to question, is God's way really good? Is God's way really just? Is God's way really right and correct? Is his way perfect? Is it without error? Is it without blemish or imperfection? Is it without questionable motives or intents? And the answer is unashamedly, yes, God's way is perfect. God's way is without error. God's way is without imperfection. His motives are to be unquestioned. God's way is perfect. And when our faith begins undermined, when our faith becomes weak, often the first thing, the first mindset, the first doubt that enters is the question, is God's way perfect? really the best way did what God allowed to happen should it have happened should I have gotten this hand dealt to me should I have been tasked with this sickness or this particular job situation should I have this problem in my life should I not have had that solution and in our minds and our heart we begin to question God why me why now Why not somebody else? Is God's way truly without error or spot? You see, God's way is not always my way. I wish it was, but it's not always my way. Sometimes my flesh, sometimes your flesh, fights against God's way. It says, God, I don't like what you gave to me. I don't like the hand that you've delivered into my arena. Lord, I don't like the opposition that you've allowed me to face. I don't like the diagnosis. I don't like the the opposition. Yet God asks his servants to step out into the unknown. God asks his servants to walk in the dark, lit only by the path from him. And as David is running through the wilderness, I am sure that these thoughts were going to bombard him. God, I didn't ask to be anointed king. I was merely watching the sheep. This is your fault. And Lord, when you anointed me king, I definitely didn't want to be chased by the king. I thought I was going to go from, you know, from little shepherd and, and then all the way to, to the throne, but, but now everyone wants to kill me, then the, the whole country. And, what's going on? And David here says, but as for for God, his way is perfect. His way is perfect. Oh, we could tell the stories, could we not, about the the hand of God in our life. On the back end, on the back end. But faith says, God, your hand in my life is good in the midst. When we don't see the solution, when we don't see the answer. You understand that we've... (laughs) We've not been on the mind of God since the day we were born. We were on the mind of God before the foundation of the earth. It didn't just happen the day that I was born that God said, oh, think about J.D. No, no, no. My friends, before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. He thought about me and he thought about you. He knew the path that I would take and that you would take. He knows that path. He designs that path. And when we follow God's way, the best way... There are times maybe difficulty. I see Moses had a path that got him criticism and ungratefulness. His whole ministry. There's hardly any time in Scripture that it says the children of Israel were like, wow, Moses, great choice. Scripture is filled with, wow, Moses, that was bad, that was bad, that was bad, and you're bad. And yet that was God's path for Moses. As he took them out of slavery... It's a good thing you and I weren't Moses. Had the power, like, fine, you're going back to slavery. They wouldn't have wanted that either, by the way. Because every time they got what they wanted, it's not what they wanted. 
On a side note, one of the scariest verses, one of the hardest verses I think in Scripture, is where God says, and I, he granted their request and sent leanness to their soul. I pray that God does not always grant my requests because my request can bring leanness to my soul. His path, oh, it's made to be difficult, but it's the best path. Daniel, on a path that took him to the lion's den. Now, on the back end, it was the best sermon illustration ever. On the front end, short sermon. The three Hebrew children, paths that took him to the fiery furnace. Stephen, the first martyr, a path that led him to death. Paul, a path that led to imprisonment and execution. Christ, a path that led to the cross. All these were on paths that God designed for them. As for God, his way is perfect. And you and I in our life must begin by saying, God, your way is the best way. Your path is the best path. Lord, I may not understand it. I may not even enjoy it always. I don't think Job, Job had some days where he wasn't enjoying life. But Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. His path is perfect. But number two, we see in this passage another aspect in our trust. Not only does it say, as for God, his way is perfect, it says the word of the Lord is tried. God's word, there's the purity of his word. It cannot be broken. It cannot fail. It will always come to to fruition. What God says will take place. When he says, I will never leave thee, I'll never forsake you, he absolutely means it, and that means no matter how I feel, God is still there. Maybe you've read that poem, Footprints in the Sand. A nice little pithy poem. Many years people would put it up in their house with a picture of a beach, right? Two sets of footprints, then one set. My friends, I want my life, my desire for your life is to look back and only see one footprint, one set. The Bible says that he will carry me. The Bible says that. The Bible says that he will solve problems. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. You see, some people say, well, experience is a great teacher. My friends, a school of hard knocks is a bad school. Is it not? Well, this is what I learned. You know what? I'd rather have a simple look in the word of God, which has been tried and tested and has always come forth, has always come to fruition, who has always been pure and revealed and cannot fail. We live in a day where the word of God is attacked regarding its reliability But remember that from the early days of creation, the word of God was attacked. It's been occurring since God made the heavens and the earth, and it will not stop until God comes back and sets all things right. But the Bible says that you and I can trust the word of God. Lord, your word is tried. It's dependable. I can rest in it. I was asked again this morning if we would print another set of books for another month. We printed books for January, February, and March. I didn't print a book for April. I was kind of wondering what the response would be in the church, if anyone really cared or not. And many of you come and said, Pastor, would you give us some more devotional books? And so we're working on May. We'll get some of those things out there. But I love this. I love the fact that this church, these Christians are in the Word of God. My friends, the Word of God is tried. Get in the Word of God. I love the word of God, but trust the word of God. Meditate on the word of God. I hope it's in your heart. I hope it's in your mind. I hope it's on your phone. I hope it's in your car when you're driving. That's really where you need it, I'll tell you right now. And I hope it's in your life. And David says, as for God, his way is perfect. And the word of the Lord is tried. Now think about this. David is making a statement here on the back end when he'd been running. Remember, God's word said that he'd be king. And there's a lot of dark nights there. A lot of nights in a cave where I wondered if if that thought flit across his mind. Is God's word 
really going to happen? Will I be king or will this be my last night on this planet? Can you imagine the time we find out about it around later on in Psalms when, when Saul actually goes into the, the cave that David's at? Man, that's how close they were. And David looks back and says, listen, his way is perfect. His word, it's tried. But number three tonight, this third aspect of our faith, we see the protection of his work. He is a buckler. He's a buckler to all those that trust in him. This word buckler is not a word that we use a lot in 2023. But we do use a word that this means. And that's shield. And most of us know what a shield is. We've used shields. We'll use shields outside during a snowball fight. It may be someone else that we grab and toss in front of us. We will shield, sometimes it's our arms against something that's happening. A tree. We're, we're used to what shields, we don't understand what a shield is. And David says that God, not only is his way perfect, not only is his word tried, but that his his being, his working, is a shield of protection around him. Nothing can get through the shield of God without God allowing it through. Nothing can happen without God allowing this to happen. God is a shield. That's what we see in verses 1 and 2 about a rock and a fortress and a deliverer and strength and a horn of salvation, a high tower. You see, when I have the shield of God... Life's issues can just bounce off. You can't touch me because God is protecting me. Stronger than the scales of a dragon or the skin of a crocodile, the shield of God. More dense than any kind of metal we could locate on planet Earth, the shield of God, the protection of God is that dense and that powerful. Better? than any kind of sci-fi energy shield. Maybe you've watched some sci-fi or read about sci-fi, and it's always amazing to me on these sci-fi energy shields, they can stop laser beams, they can stop photon torpedoes. But, but like a simple, like, like, a, like a dart can get through, right? Somebody can walk through it. You can stop a nuclear bomb, but... Boy, if you walk through and do something, then you win. And my friends, God is not that easily defeated. Not in your life, not in my life, not in the life of David. There's a story about a fort that was deep in the Arabian desert. A small fortress. It was a place that a man known as the Lawrence of Arabia used to seek shelter. We read about this fort he went to. It wasn't a beautiful place, but it was a great place because of its security. It was loaded with supplies of food and water and, and weapons. And as history tells us, often when an attack would come or when attack would come, Lawrence of Arabia would retreat to the fort. And in the safety of this fort, of this fortress, he would find the defeat of his enemies. One, as they began to travel to this desert place, they would run out of supplies. Where Lawrence of Arabia had supplies, they had not enough supplies. Where they found weakness in the sun beating down and, and things that would suck the energy out, he found shade and shelter. And he was safe as long as he was in the surroundings of his fort. And my friends, when we put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ as our buckler, as our shield, as our high tower, we find supplies that will sustain us. And those coming to attack us, they will run short on supplies. The elements will affect them, but not so to those who are inside the place of safety with God Almighty. They will drink water that will cause them never to thirst again. They'll be of the bread of life and never hunger again. You find the, the sustaining force of God himself. You see, it's time that we put our faith in a real way, back in the Almighty. Rejoicing in the ways of God. Lord, thank you 
Resting in the word of God. Relying on the working of God. You see, before David wrote Psalm 18, he was fighting for his life. I'd like you to turn one other place. Because we don't always know exactly how and where these psalms are placed. But this one, we do. Remember how I mentioned that no scripture is of any private interpretation? That scripture helps define scripture? I'd like you to turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 22. We'll actually look back just about four verses at the end of 2 Samuel chapter 21. Second Samuel chapter 21, we'll look in verse number 20. And there was yet a battle in Gath. Where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes. Four and twenty in number. Twenty-four. When he counted fingers and toes, he got to twenty-four. You and I get to twenty. Sometimes nineteen and a half if you were a, a woodworker. He got to twenty-four. Verse 21, and when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were burned, born to the giant of Gath and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. And look in verse 22. I'm sorry, chapter 22, verse number 1. And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song. In the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The Lord is my rock, and him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. If you were to read the rest of this chapter, you will find almost identical to Psalm chapter 18. And in fact, please look in verse number 31 of 2 Samuel 22. As for God, his way is what? Perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. You see, David sang this song, the Bible says, after another battle where giants were defeated. And my friends, in your life and my life, there will be giants. There will be opposition. There will be Saul's. There will be Goliath's. There will be people that have six fingers and six toes. There will be situations that just don't make sense. Really, Lord? 24? You know, not even normal? Won't make sense. When you put your trust in God, when you trust that his way is perfect, when you know that his word is tried, it is tested, it will be accomplished, and when you understand that he is a shield, a buckler to all that trust in him, then, my friends, you find the hand of God in your life. We trust a lot of things. We trust our eyesight. We trust our experience. We trust the teenager who is making minimum wage at McDonald's to cook our food. So why can't we put our trust and our faith back in the almighty God? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. But with faith, my friends, nothing is impossible.